Так, у нас последний доклад. So we have uh, a last speech, uh, it will be in English, uh, last uh, in our plenary section, uh, not in uh, the whole conference. So uh, I uh, would like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Pirmin Schneckberg-Weithofen, professor emeritus in the University of Leipzig. Uh, he has worked on many topics such as logic, uh, course for mathematics, uh, course for language to, to name just a few. Uh, he most uh, famous for his analytical interpretation of uh, Hegelian philosophy. So, uh, Professor Stecker, uh, I uh, would like to give you a microphone. Dobry den. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, what I want to present today uh, is more or less a couple of theses, which in my opinion are more or less self-understood, but uh, it's worthwhile to discuss them, I think. The first is, there is no immediate correspondence between verbalized knowledge and the world. Uh, it's against correspondence theory. The world, as we refer to it, is not in itself conceptually structured, without our interventions. I think that was even a platonic insight. It is certainly not mathematically structured per se. Its conceptual structure is always already our structure. As a result, there are differences between my world, our world, and the world, such that we should have problems with Wittgenstein's aphorisms in the Tractatus, especially where he says, that I am my world and that the world is my world. So I am the world or something like that. The structured world to which we refer in our knowledge of the world is always already formed by ideal forms. That was the platonic insight. We purposefully encode such forms in our sentences or structured propositions by which we talk about our world. The mathematical structures come into being through our idealizations, which lead to standing sentences expressing generic knowledge. A paradigm case is geometry since an antiquity as the mathematical structure of the form of rectangular solids, as I would say, people are much too fast when they say it's the structure of space that we can produce like bricks in different sizes, but by far not in arbitrary sizes and exactitudes. Before Einstein, no one had realized that Euclidean geometry, if applied to space of relative, uh, relatively moved bodies, is just an analogy. So it, it's not just a description. There is no infinite rectangular space at all. There are no straight lines and flat planes in real space. Do you understand me right? Is that okay? okay. Yes, fine, fine, thank you. Okay. Using analogical or metaphorical mo models in concrete cases now always is mediated by a projective use, just as any use of metaphors or other figurative forms of speech. And this is my main title that we forget always when we do philosophy of language or analytic philosophy, that applying language has a special form, which is not a form of sentential semantics, but it is semantics. Therefore, we have to distinguish between the sentences that we set as formally true in models on one side, their applications in empirical context and concrete speech acts on the other side, and we use these sentences, even when they are not real models, if they are only generic sentences, as rules, as inference tickets, as Ryle has said. In the Tractatus, Wittgenstein does not distinguish between language and speech, parole, that is between words or sentences, and for example, assertions about present or past affairs. Many people have realized that. As a result, he and the whole tradition of analytical philosophy systematically overlooks the crucial fact that we can never abstract from the speaker from time and place in empirical propositions. Empirical always should mean 
uh, that we are talking about a narration, a story uh, about things here and there. So empirical reference to the world presupposes a reference to a place and situation here and now relative to an imagined speaker or to a real speaker together with the corresponding context of speech. It is a deep illusion to use a principle of expressibility and to say that we could get rid of this dependency from subjective perspectives in empirical assertions by replacing, for example, deictical pronouns and describe the space and time. Any such description has a zero point. Moreover, in empirical reality, there is only one way of changing perspectives, namely by moving to other places. There is no travel into the past and the future, and there is no way of looking into the heads of other persons. This makes the use of generic knowledge about types of things and events so essential when we try to talk about objective matters, which presupposes, of course, perspectival change. We can jointly refer to them only as instantiations of generic types and place them into a space-time order of other manifestations of things and matters. In a sense, Kant came already quite near to this insight, and in my reading, Hegel has developed it. In short, for perspectival changes and object-related reference, we must master the practical semantical forms of projecting generic knowledge about types and things and processes onto our experience. In this way, generic models give structure to the world and make objectivity possible. Without it, there is no objectivity. Not in the sense of looking on the world from a God's perspective, but looking on the world from our perspective. This is the reason why children acquire generic knowledge in the first phase of learning and in the first uh, language encoded, uh, and only later they can talk about singular items. Uh, precisely that they are singular. Uh, by the way, animals cannot refer to singular items almost at all. These are very deep general truths. They show how metaphorical the thesis of an isomorphism between the world and the linguistic representation of the world is, as we find it illustrated in Wittgenstein's sketches of gnomic oracles in the nevertheless deservedly famous Tractatus. However, there is a whole manifold of structures hidden in the very notion of sentences as Wittgenstein uses the word, just as in the parallel concept of constatierung, that is empirical assertion by Moritz Schlick or Wilfried Sellers. Careless thinkers are regularly seduced into the thesis of a plurality of words, words or even of an incommensurability of word pictures. But the unity of the world as real reality is not determined by the uniformity of a single world model. The later Wittgenstein approaches this insight by recognizing the purpose dependence of our always merely local models of the world. There is not one theory of the world, not one true world view. Rather, we work with local structures that can be complementary to each other precisely in the way as Niels Bohr recognizes, or at least suspects as the basic form of the various forms of physical world modeling. It is, however, uh, not easy to cope with this locality of our representation and explanations of the world. The same holds for the dependency of empirical assertions on a priori generic knowledge and a priori generic knowledge and on a concrete set of relevant aspects. Wittgenstein's idea of purely empirical sentences in the Tractatus that do not presuppose generic knowledge at all, expressed in sentences that are learned as conceptually true, is therefore, in my opinion, utterly unrealistic. As a result, logical atomism and empiricism cannot account at all for dispositions as default inferences that are responsible for the very fact that virtually any empirical utterance, any constatierung is fallible due to the lack of control here and now 
about the fulfillment of the normally, generically, conceptually expected and therefore predicted consequences. All interesting properties of things and matters are dispositional, and uh, we have access to, disposi to dispositions only by language and uh, only by uh, linguistic inferences. There are no purely empirical state descriptions. That is the result of this first part. And I think this was already an insight of Hegel's semantic holism in the phenomenology in the famous uh, chapter three and four. Second, there are no sufficient cause for all events in the world. There is another myth in some parts of analytical philosophy. Uh, John Mackey writes about the cement of the universe. We are probably still, as Heidegger puts it, in the time of the worldview of ideology, precisely when we do not grasp the conceptual status of our principles for representing and explaining the world. Heidegger's warning not to confuse the ideals in our world pictures with the world of all beings themselves applies, for example, to the fulfillments of our wishes to make global predictions. The belief in a continuous causal nexus of all world events is only the ideal of such wish fulfillment. The principle of sufficient cause in Leibniz or better of causal connectedness in causation of all events by a suitable causa efficience is indeed confused from the beginning. Latin causa just refers to all things and matters and not just to causa efficience. Not even a principle of continuity of bodily movements holds without exceptions. And Hegel's insight is still underestimated that is, it is part of our scheme that we try to represent the whole system of moved bodies as good as possible by a good distribution of the forces responsible for the changes to the material bodies in a holistic way. So we have things and then uh, the task is to put the forces into the things and build up their movements and changes as if they were the result of the um, things. Newton's system was and is a great success because it could use effectively the mass of the bodies as the differential condition for inferential consequences in the system of mechanical interactions, Wechselwirkung. However, we should never overestimate the scope of this approach and it is limited. I think we have to read again what Schelling and Hegel, Ritter and Oersted saw in Jena namely that electromagnetic forces are of a different type. They all have urged a new understanding of physics that surpasses by far Newtonian mechanics. And uh, it, it's not well known that they were very good in uh, this um, uh, analysis. The principle of continuity, for example, is vaguely expressed by the thesis that nature doesn't make leaps. However, it is only metaphorically transferred from the domain of medium-sized bodies to a completely different realm of experience and speech when we apply it to subatomic articles and thus to electrodynamic and quantum mechanical phenomena. Nevertheless, some still talk as if these particles behaved in the same way as normal solids on the one hand, the mass point, points of the 18th century uh, mathematical mechanics on the other. Instead, all particles are theoretical objects of speech. The transfer of normal properties of solids to these particles is not trivial at all. Otherwise, one would not be so surprised that the behavior of these so-called particles obviously differs substantially from the behavior of solids. These differences are known to be so essential that some again resort to a principle of direct action at the distance, actio in distance, and other even talk about uh, backward causation. I do not want to go into details about this, I just want to mention. But there are no space-time uh, points in the world at all, and precision is always limited. When we think that some real explanations, for example, in solid state dynamics are quite exact, we are only saying that they come sufficiently close to our ideal wishes. 
our causal predictions of real movements of bodies are indeed highly precise in some respects. Yet, each of these approximations to an exact ideal is always of the structure of a platonic metaxis. This, is in this in turn means that we use rather coarse scales or margin of precision, at least in comparison to the ideal. How we proceed in this process can already be seen in the case of uh, geometry. We say, for example, that the real surface comes close to the ideal form of a plane if it sufficiently flat, that means if other flat surfaces fit sufficiently and no, there are no holes in it. All real planes are therefore merely more or less flat. The same applies to straight lines, right angles or circles. There is a concealed idealism or Platonism in modern mathematical natural science now. It consists in the hypothesis of our own ideally desired forms of representation and explanation of experimental events and results. Nancy Cartwright's question of how the laws of physics lie is therefore entirely justified. The question is how the laws of physics or the basic principles of the other natural sciences are applied appropriately, how their status is to be understood, what it means at all to declare them formally true, and how we justify these formal truths and laws and principles not just by singular exper uh, experiment, uh, experiments. The first step to be taken here is of course the insight into the formality or ideality of the truth of natural laws and principles. We uh, should never uh, misunderstand and un uh, underestimate uh, these problems of measurements and applications of laws. This gets clear if we understand the real context of Werner Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in general terms. It estimates, so to speak, in general terms, the mistake that we always make when we calculate with mathematical points of space and time and trajectories, and when we interpret the differential geometric gradients as impulses. That means uh, Heisenberg shows more or less the faults, the, the mistakes in the mathematical model when we use differential calculus. Reality is never more precisely determined than Heisenberg's estimate. The details are not of interest here. So the method of science consists in experienced applications of good analogies. There is a hearsay in, uh, uh, phys uh, uh, in physics, that uh, the best model is, a, uh, the, the best thing that uh, the, uh, um, we have in our science is an analogy, and I think it's true. All this means that our ideal world views and favorite theories or their axioms or principles can always hold our th thinking captive, as we can say with Wittgenstein. Such Platonism, better Pythagoreanism, belongs to the childhood of philosophizing as Hegel's uh, has said aptly. It is a feature both of the theological worldview of the Mediterranean Stoicism, Hellenized Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and the anti -the theological scientific worldview of the 18th century. And it's still salient, it's still alive. It is true that Platonism was highly successful in both theology and science. But the reason for this is far from being understood as such. One overlooks the practical ability still necessary for a competent use of the corresponding forms of speech, representation and explanation. That is the free reason of experience judgment, as uh, Kant calls it, um, Urteilskraft. Hegel calls this empirical form of a reasonable, yet never purely literal application of theories to real empirical cases dialectic. This is a side remark that we have uh, to have a new understanding of what dialectics is. It's applying semantics, but it's uh, applicative semantics. Our, theory, our theories and worldviews and the linguistic divisions of our experience of the world that are guided by them are neither the consequence of, of purely subjective 
experience not simply the result of arbitrary settings. It's not conventional. Rather, the implicit and practical and then also explicit verbalized reflexive recognition reflects the generic experiences that we make in the use of our concepts in the representation and explanation of the world. I think this was Hegel's basic insight. So we have, we go back and forth between uh, analogies and experiment and experience. Reality shows itself in the average, average success in using our always already generically constituted conceptual orientations. This makes the term empiricism so ambiguous. In the narrow sense, only narrative and subjective reports about my or our observations of individual facts here and now, possibly as a result of mere trial and error, are empirical. Empirical science does not exist because it's experimental and conceptual. Genuine experiments are already a controlled testing and pushing of forms of the limits of previous general abilities and generic knowledge. So we have um, a, a transcendental step upwards to higher knowledge. In the context of this logic of research, Hegel's word dialectics also refers to what Charles Sanders Peirce called the abductive form of justifying a theoretical model as the best among the available modelings or linguistic representations or explanations in a field of phenomena. So we can never have anything else than the best possible representation. And, and it's an, another domain where we evaluate the best possible representation. Therefore, without their knowledge, the pragmatic thinking of say John Dewey or Karl Popper goes back both systematically and historically to Hegel through the mediations of Josiah Royce and William James. This is, of course, a, um, a pun because Popper doesn't know that, and he criticizes Hegel for uh, his own wrong reading. The main problem of traditionally Anglo-Saxon and then also neo-positivist empiricism is indeed the mistaken identification of experience with mere local perception, a mistake that Plato already recognizes and analyzes in the dialogue Theatetus. No wonder that English speaking authors like Robert Brandom would therefore prefer to avoid these words, experience or, uh, or, or, or even empirical, but he doesn't like the word reason also. I think it does not help if we just skip the words. The task of philosophy consists precisely in clarifying the concepts of rational experience of the world. Avoiding the naming of the subject but ultimately leads to philosophy's self-abandonment, and I would not uh, follow that. Random concern is as follows. The empiricist notion of immediate experience is misleading. Experience is always already conceptually formed. Here, here he totally agrees with, with John McDowell. It is always already experienced with our own judgments. It is therefore always already higher level. Therefore, if we want to cut nature conceptually at its point, joints, as Plato puts it, then our distinctions articulated by words and conclusions guided by these words should not be arbitrary, but as much as possible conform to generic experience, not to singular cases and leads to mainly good orientations. This pragmatic understanding avoids any metaphysics that speaks of a mirror of nature or an imme immediate image of our truth uh, in itself uh, and all these things. Conceptual knowledge contains prejudgments. Conceptual norms of differentiation and differentially conditioned inferences hang together with general a priori knowledge. I think that is what Bob Brandom and, and John McDowell uh, clearly saw. For many propositions to have any meaning at all, and thus to be uh, false or true at all, many other propositions must already be true. The search for elementary propositions beyond these gradations are illusionary. Heidegger and Gadamer were right to say that all empirical human cognition 
rests on prejudgments in a sense, even in a similar way as animal cognitions are, uh, rest on preformed instincts. Because these generic truths are, as inference tickets are automa automatized, second nature. In particular, a distinction must be made between a transcendental or presuppositional logical relation of sense dependence in Robert Brandom's uh, sense of sense dependence and a quite different kind of dependence of the reference on the existence of the reference objects, reference dependence. Our talk of the moon is sense dependent on our distinctions between suns or stars, solar planets and moons. It is reference dependence on the fact that the moon exists, existed and will exist, independent of what we know about it. By saying something like this, and perhaps adding that the other things of physics really do exist, such as electrons or other subatomic sub particles, we are admittedly investing words that are meaning dependent on our knowledge or our theoretical convictions but we immediately erase this, the time dependency and perspectivity of this very knowledge, abstract it from ourselves as speakers and speak de re about the reference dependency of the good experiences we have had with this corresponding theories. That means in objective or object level talk, we cancel the speakers and we cancel the theories and we just think as if we could talk sideways on as John McDowell says, about objects, but this is an illusion. Brandon shows how we are to understand the form of speech of the array, namely not as the eradication of any perspective of speakers in a statement of nowhere about the world in itself, but by ourselves standing up for the assertion as true. That means I, take, I over, uh, undertake the commitment. The distinction between a speech de re, for example, about the sun and de dicto, for example, about the sun god Helios, who the Greeks think uh, leads the sun chariot, is thus an internal distinction. Uh, I think this is shown by Bob Brandon. It concerns the difference between one's own assumptions undertaking, also acknowledgement or recognition of validity claims within each of our conceptually formed systems of knowledge and the attribution, the assignment of such validity claims to others, if necessary, without assuming them or, un, uh, or just criticize them. While I would say in modus de dicto that the Greeks believed that the sun was a disc on the chariot of Helios, I cannot say anything about this disc, the re, it does not exist as I know. So the re statements are distinguished from the dicto statement, statements by different, different inferential norms for the respective commitment of the speaker. That is the analysis of Brandon. It goes back, by the way, to Quine and Frege in a certain sense. So theories are generic articulations of general experience. Another insight follows almost immediately from what had been said so far. There is no classification of things or qualities without corresponding inferential commitments and entitlements. That means permissions to infer and obligation to justify their inferences. Already the early Wittgenstein remarks that we cannot be interested in mere classificatory, uh, classificatory statements without further inferences. Nevertheless, he did not see how inferential content enters state descriptions. He thought, because there is a, a harmony between uh, uh, classificatory or truth value in uh, arithmetic and uh, inference rules that this can hold for state descriptions also. But this is wrong. Uh, and uh, he therefore just overlooked all genericity and all conceptual preconditions for empirical statement. And since this is so, we now can understand why only in good cases, we need no retractions because all empirical statements are fallible just because the generic predictions go far beyond what we can control here and now. And therefore only in the good cases, um, uh, um, we are uh, safe that we do not have to say, well, 
uh, I thought there is, and I was sure that there was milk in the fridge, but there is no milk in the fridge because it was poisonous uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and that shows why an empirical statement like there is milk in the fridge cannot be decided just by observation statements. And since this holds for such easy statements because of their inferential impact, um, the idea that we have a direct basis for knowledge just in, in these empirical constatierungen in the early analytic ph philosophy, of course, was wrong. Uh, I just finished with some remarks on formal logic. Perhaps we can see now uh, a little bit clearly, uh, more clearly how generic knowledge essentially co-determines the semantics and thus always also inferential contact and empirical statements in the form of a system of default conclusions and normal expectations. And in applications, we have to take care of that. So there are always privations and, and accidents possible. As material knowledge, it goes far beyond purely formal inferences, especially beyond mere definitional and terminological language rules, as for example, in the standard use of the logical words, not, and, and for all, defining the rules of Frege's predicate calculus. This logic holds, unfortunately, only without exceptions in pure arithmetics, that means in higher set theory, and uh, to assume that it holds directly for things in the world is just mistaken. And uh, therefore, um, formal logic is not at all the logic of language. It's the logic of the notation of arithmetics. The difference between material terminological inferences and judgments and purely formal terminological rules lies in the way they are justified in the public domain. In the formal analytical and terminological case, the setting is purely linguistic convention, either in the sense of an implicit custom or an explicit agreement in view of terminological standardization or in the system of arithmetics and set theory. In the material conceptual case, a sentence expressing a rule or norm fixes a general knowledge of the world, as in the case of whales are mammals, or articulates inferential norms of a general practice, as in the case there are sanctions for trespassing legal norms. The word general knowledge names only a sub-area of the meaning determining public domain. Wittgenstein's talk of a form of life, on the other hand, sounds highly big or too big, like the word culture. It carries with it certain relativistic connotations and doesn't go into these details which I wanted to present you. Spasibo. Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, Professor uh, Steckler. Uh, any questions? Is there any questions in uh, auditory? In Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, Evgeny Vasilich Borisov, uh, professor of uh, Tomsk State University, professor of uh, Russian uh, Science um, uh, Society. Um, Hello. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, and uh, my question is as follows. Uh, you, <clears throat> uh, you presented very clearly and convincingly the uh, thesis that uh, there is no elementary knowledge and no elementary truth uh, in, in the real life, so to speak. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, in logic, uh, in every logical system, uh, I mean formal logical system, uh, we always have, just um, in syntactic aspect, we always uh, have uh, elementary or atomic sentences or atomic formulae. And uh, on the other hand, uh, in the semantic aspect, we always uh, do have elementary truths uh, that are determined by, by, by the interpretation of predicates and so on. And uh, so uh, my question is, uh, do you have in mind any, uh, any um, satisfactory uh, formal representation 
uh, of uh, knowledge without elementary truth, uh, knowledge that uh, experience that always involves uh, some inferential content and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are there are um, uh, people who are doing uh, computer science uh, and they develop default logics. Uh, where they uh, have classi classified the empirical level, uh, empirical level, uh, uh, which are these statements which have reference to datical things, and generic sentences which are rules, and they call them defaults. Uh, for example, um, uh, birds fly is a default, and then you need exceptions, and uh, uh, and uh, um, these default rules are used in, in the meantime uh, in these computer uh, language processing uh, 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 concepts. But of course, this presupposes exactly what I want to say. We have to split up the notion of sentences here, uh, looking at assertions, looking at sentences which are empirical and looking at sentences which belong to a canonized default set of differential uh, inferences. And if we do that, then we can develop that uh, but the logic doesn't look so nice anymore, and uh, we, um, and it gets more complicated. Uh, but um, uh, Bob Random is trying to work on that. Um, uh, he's talking about non-monotonic logic because the non-monotonicity comes from the fact that if if a default is um, uh, denied, for example, if I know that the cat uh, has only has has had an accident then the default that cats have four legs might not hold. And therefore, if I know more, then I can uh, conclude less. And that means, of course, that the logic is not monotonic anymore. But this is a totally different system of logic uh, uh, than we are um, uh, used to when we look at the logic of these mathematicized systems uh, with the elementary statement fixed. Um, they are even fixed when we when we look at the uh, variations of models. And in the end, my claim that uh, Frege's logic holds only for arithmetic holds even by the proofs of Gödel because um, uh, the models are just set theoretic models, and that theory is higher arithmetic. And and therefore, we never leave the realm of mathematics when we do logic in this way. And therefore, uh, my claim is. When we want to do a philosophy of language and, and when we want to do real uh, language processing, we have to uh, leave these ideas a little bit behind, at least. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, any, any other questions? Hello, yes. <clears throat> So, uh, Professor Steckler, uh, thank you for your speech. Yeah, I thank you. We're, we're very glad to meet you in uh, Tomsk, uh, even uh, online. So, I hope you, you maybe sometime you would come here. By we, will, we will keep contact. And thank you very much for the invitation. It was a great, a great pleasure for me. Um, спасибо. До свидания. До свидания.